We have a very exciting webinar for you today, which forms part of our Great Lakes Economic Forum virtual series. With us is an expert speaker from World Green Building Council who will share with us the Beyond the Business Case report, which was launched just this past November at COP26 and outlines why we can't afford not to invest in a sustainable built environment. As you may know, the Great Lakes is the largest freshwater system in the world. It is a complex ecosystem that sustains life for thousands of species and provides drinking water for over 40 million Americans and Canadians. The region is home to 107 million people and provides 51 million jobs. That's nearly one third of the combined US and Canada workforce. The region is without a doubt the economic engine of North America. This mega region holds both environmental and economic significance, and it is crucial to knowledge sharing, uh, is crucial that knowledge sharing and coordinated action is taking place across the border and across sectors in thinking about the future and positioning the Great Lakes as a leader and model for the rest of the world. The reality is that the climate crisis and environmental pressures are increasing at an alarming pace boosting the sustainability of the Great Lakes region and ensuring its long-term success therefore presents challenges, but also holds numerous opportunities. And through the Great Lakes Economic Forum and sector dialogues like today's webinar, the council is striving to create the most prosperous, innovative, sustainable, livable, and welcoming region in the world. It's projected that within the next 50 years, at least 1 billion people globally could be left needing to migrate due to climate change and climate disasters. People will move to where the resources are. And in North America, that's the Great Lakes region. With relatively stable climate, rich farmland, and 20% of the world's surface freshwater, people, companies, and investors are seeing opportunity in the Great Lakes. More people moving to the region will lead to economic growth and revitalization, including development in real estate and demand for infrastructure, which is just one of the reasons why today's webinar topic, investing in a sustainable built environment is so important. So connecting with global thought leadership and addressing important topics like sustainable development allows us to align synergies and best practice to solve real problems facing the world and the binational Great Lakes region. That is why I'm very pleased to have the World Green Building Council sharing with us their groundbreaking report, Beyond the Business Case. Their report provides a unique perspe perspective for decision makers to accelerate the built environment sustainability transition by capitalizing on the economic opportunities, addressing risk mitigation, and embracing the social value case. Today's program includes a presentation from our expert speaker, Katrina Brady from World Green Building Council, followed by a Q&A session where Katrina will address audience questions. So if you have any questions at any time throughout the presentation, please type them in the Zoom Q&A box. We will have about 15 minutes at the end to address as many questions as we can. So now without further ado, I would like to uh, introduce our expert speaker, Katrina Brady. Katrina is the Director of Strategy and Development at the World Green Building Council. Her work is focused upon the strategic development and implementation of new global and regional programs for the World Green Building Council network, consisting of 70 member councils and their 36,000 members. As part of this role, Katrina manages World GBC's global program on resources and circularity in the built environment dedicated to enhancing resource efficiency and catalyzing the circular economy within the building and construction sectors. Katrina also serves on a number of expert task forces related to areas of sustainability, including health and well being, sustainable infrastructure, and the circular economy in the built environment. She has authored notable industry publications, most recently the Beyond Buildings Report on Sustainable Infrastructure and Beyond the Business Case Report, both released in 2021. So Katrina, I now hand it over to you. 
Thank you so much, Laura. And hello, everyone. Good morning, afternoon. It's an absolute pleasure to be with you today. Thank you so much to the Council of the Great Lakes Region for having me. While I just get my slides up, I can reflect on Laura's opening remarks. I'm speaking to you today from London in the United Kingdom. So uh, slightly later in the day for me. Um, apologies if you can hear a dog barking in the background. Uh, that's the challenges of working from home. But it's my absolute pleasure to be here today to be able to present our Beyond the Business Case report. So for a word of introduction, first of all, as to who the World Green Building Council are, we are a global members network comprising of 70 national green building councils around the world, representing a collective membership of 36,000 organisations. Our strategy, as you can see down the left hand side of my slide, is aligned to the sustainable development goals. We have identified three core areas within the targets and indicators of the SDGs that align most closely to buildings and infrastructure, and those are climate action, health and well-being, and resources and circularity. So I will dive into the specifics of the built environment before going into the business case, and I'm sure that I'm speaking to Many of you today who are experts already in this space, but some of you who are slightly newer to the topic. So uh, some, some statistics to put it all into perspective, first of all. So as, uh, as many of us know, as we saw in the Global ABC report published at COP last year, we I'm sure are all aware of the fact that the built environment is responsible for a huge quantity of global greenhouse gas emissions. When we just look at buildings by themselves, that represents around 37%. But when we bring infrastructure in as well, that number goes up to about 75% of energy related carbon emissions. So absolutely ginormous quantities of the, the energy that we create and the emissions from that are then translated into our built environment. Then in terms of demographic changes, population growth, we know that the world uh, in all areas of the world is increasingly urbanizing and we are seeing global population rise as well as population movement. Cities represent 80% of our GDP and more than half of the population now live in cities for the first time in history. And consequently, because of that, we're expecting the city a size of Paris to be constructed every week, which for me really illustrates that number of 230 billion square meters in a much more realistic and frankly horrifying way. Consequently, with a new Paris being built every week, we know that the requirement for materials is going to be absolutely huge and 40 for 50% of global resources are used then for housing, for construction, for infrastructure, for built assets. And when we're talking about infrastructure, there's so much work still left to do if we want to achieve sustainable development for everyone everywhere. 75% of the infrastructure needed by 2050 to hit our sustainability target still needs to be built. So the environmental footprint of that could be even more ginormous than what we're already experiencing today. And so that sets the context of the world that we live in. The World Green Building Council and our members recognize that the built environment as a sector has huge opportunity to try and reduce these emissions and encourage sustainability. And that's where the business case comes in. I hope this animation is working properly. Um, it's very exciting to have moving slides, but you know, with technology, this chose not to work on stage when we launched it at COP26. So I hope it is working for you today. But with that context of the absolute urgency of addressing the emissions from the built environment, we recognize that we cannot only allow the leaders in industry to make progress. We have to ensure that we are moving the whole market, that every building, piece of infrastructure and asset is on the same ambitious trajectory for decarbonization by 2030 um, and whole net zero carbon emission reduction by 2050. So that's why the narrative of this is why you can't afford not to invest in a sustainable built environment 
to highlight the fact that this isn't just for the flagship organizations interested in sustainability, but this is for everybody and demonstrating the reasons why carrot or stick, perhaps sustainability is a, is a better uh, business or financial proposition than they would have realized previously. So a small world word on the background to this report, just as we dive into some of the details. This builds on a previous business case report that World GVC published in 2013. And last year, we were reflecting that that report was still being referenced incredibly regularly. It was still a very searched area of our website. We know from uh, analytics and things like that, that the business case is a really searched term in built environment websites in our website as well. And we get asked about the business case all the time on panels and things like that. And we needed meaningful work to be able to point to that was relevant for the conversation today and that we could use as the support for our prominent message for cities, regions and built environment day at COP26 last year. Also, and I'll go into this more later, we wanted to capture the changing context of the time from things like policy change to the rise of sustainable finance, but really notably the rise in social value and awareness of social sustainability. And it was very important for all of the organizations who came together to co-produce this report that we demonstrated the value proposition that wasn't purely financial, but it was also ethical that sustainable built assets are also just the right thing to do as well as potentially uh, enhancing an organization's bottom line. So I briefly mentioned the organizations there who contributed to this report. You can see their logos on screen here. This was our wonderful development task force of green building councils and private and public sector partners with whom we are very thankful for their expert contribution and subject matter to be able to develop this really powerful report. So diving into the content now, throughout the report, there are seven irrefutable co-benefits for investing in a sustainable built environment that are demonstrated across both the financial and the social value case. And hopefully you can see it on my screen, but reading around from if it's like a clock from, uh, from one to 12. Uh, these are social benefits, occupant benefits, things like health, well-being, and productivity of the occupant, operating costs, but also considering supply chain and construction phases, as well as lower cost to operational phase, risk mitigation, um, and so providing resilience to the inevitable climate change impacts that we're going to face, as well as future-proofing against legislative changes or corporate reporting expectations and reputational risk. Higher asset values linked both to enhanced performance and desirability. And there are loads of great examples of that. Investment opportunities because of the rapidly transitioning finance sector, protecting investments, supporting share prices, and of course the increasing requirements of ESG, environmental, social and governance reporting. Penultimately, we looked at access to finance, so quite similar, but focusing more on the availability of finance for green buildings from banks, bonds and institutional investors. And finally, the wider role of business that organizations are recognizing their responsibility to engage with sustainable development and that includes environmental action, but also social action and commit to considerations broader than profit margins. And we saw in case studies from around the world, in theory, from data, from practice, these themes coming up again and again and again um, in different examples and different typologies around the world. And here's a quick excerpt of the report, which I think summarizes uh, the key takeaway really nicely that there are a multitude of economic imperatives and opportunities for investing, developing, designing, constructing, or occupying sustainable buildings or infrastructure assets. These range from higher sale or rental value, reduced construction and operating costs to lower asset risk and insurance premiums. However, for the global real estate sector today, the value proposition is broadening and increasing in prominence. 
And that final piece, I think, is, part, is one of the most exciting things about this report, that we really tried not to frame it too much in the current context. We tried to make it really future looking. Uh, and I'll come on to the specific future scenario content that we published a wee bit later on. But to try and ensure that in 10 years time, people are still finding great value from this research as they did with the previous publication that we did in 2013. So one of the things I found really interesting in the collection of information about the report that I'm really enjoying showing people now is that we were able to place the business case in the context of barriers that existed globally, but then also be able to analyze them by region. And you can see on this slide, these vary from financial barriers to lack of awareness to market demand through to political support and incentives. And to tackle these barriers, all in all, we present the expansive value proposition for a sustainable built environment. You can see on this table, and no need to read it, I'll go through it all in detail shortly, but within the context, we cover the, the financial business case, the drivers of that, the points of the business case, and then also the drivers of the social value case and what that looks like in practice as well, as well as concluding with the future value costs. So. I will run through each of these areas just now. I'll go through these at a reasonably high level, but I'm summarizing about 100 pages of report here into 20, 30 minutes. So please do put any questions in the chat box of anything that you would like, to like me to dive into in more detail. So firstly, an analysis of the context of today, of the drivers, of today's business case for sustainability in real estate. And they included, as you would expect, policy change. Uh, policy change we've experienced so far, but also that that we expect to come soon. Now, one of the biggest indicators that further policy change will come is from nationally determined contributions, which our national governments are contributing, they're updating them, and they are committing to decarbonisation targets across different sectors in order to meet the targets of the Paris Agreement. And 136 countries so far have mentioned buildings in the built environment within their NDCs. And some of them have specified specific things like an increase in focus on energy efficiency and building fabrics. Some have been more ambitious around whole life carbon. But with these policy requirements coming in at national level, we can be sure that that will trickle down to, to regulation for buildings of all types in terms of energy use, generation, efficiency, et cetera. Also at city level, we know that there are over a thousand cities that have committed to having emissions by 2030. And this is particularly exciting because cities can obviously make regulatory change to much faster pace than country or regional level which I think is one of the exciting opportunities about talking in this webinar, being able to talk to such an important region and to consider the, the sustainability strategies um, that are relevant for your region rather than just the whole nations. So on top of policy change, another major driver was, of course, finance, sustainable finance and incoming regulations such as carbon pricing, which we're seeing all over the world as a significant consideration for organizations operating on the global market and something we expect to be increasingly prevalent. As well as the rise of sustainable finance and ESG reporting. And ESG, I think, is a term that was barely mentioned in our 2013 report, but was a huge theme in the research that we undertook for this. And it's estimated that ESG funds under management will represent the majority of proportions of mutual fund assets by 2025. And there are fantastic statements out there from major institutional investors and other capital market ambassadors that they simply won't be engaging with organizations who aren't undertaking ESG reporting or other sustainability responsibilities soon. So it's amazing to see the market moving that way. And we try to support and emphasize the opportunity of ESG within the market, calling for more ambition to be placed around the built environment specifically, and emphasizing the fact that ESG is increasingly becoming an industry norm. 
One of the reasons ESG is increasingly becoming an industry norm here in Europe is because of the EU taxonomy. Uh, very prevalent here in Europe, but I think it's certainly notable in all geographies. We've in engaged very closely with our colleagues in the United States and in the Canada. And the Green Building Council is there, who we know are taking a very strong interest in the potential regulatory impacts on a broader scale. And as you may know, with the EU taxonomy, organizations of a certain size and turnover will uh, re be required to undertake ESG reporting. It will be mandatory. So this is really going to enforce a major movement towards sustainability disclosure, which hopefully is the first step towards sustainability action. So how does that context create a business case? Well, in a lot of ways. And this is a very brief run over of chapters and chapters of really interesting information that ranges from greater access to investment that green buildings have developed to be one of the most important asset classes in the green bond market. From, as I talked about before, ESG and corporate reputation with institutional investors foreseeing a time when they'll limit allocations exclusively to managers with a formal approach to sustainable investing. And that includes three of the world's biggest asset managers, which is really amazing as a, as a signal to the rest of the market. Higher asset value and desirability, we've seen again and again, but it's amazing to see it echoed around the world that sustainable buildings tend to have higher asset values and retain those values over conventional buildings, as well as lower operating costs and higher occupancy rates. That ties into these assets being a resilient investment with lower risk of stranded assets, which physically we know is a huge risk as we are in a world where the climate will be changing, whether or not the, that the world warms one and a half or three or even four degrees Celsius of warming. But stranded assets is obviously a huge risk for, for infrastructure owners and the resilience being inbuilt within sustainable assets is a huge financial future-proofing uh, opportunity. Also on the cost piece, there is everything from lower operational costs and return on investment from lower operational costs through to reduce build costs, opportunities for circularity and lower material use, preferential insurance premiums, and then um, also looking slightly more socially, at the human impact of that, that sustainable buildings have been shown time and time again to have better occupant productivity. This is most relevant in the commercial sector, really. Um, and I'll show you a case study of this in practice later on, but where we see buildings that stimulate occupant health, well-being, and productivity, we consequently see the organizations who are occupying these spaces benefiting from having a workforce who are more engaged, they're more present, and they are ultimately increasing the organization's turnover by being more productive. So now onto the other side of the value proposition, the social side. And for us at World GBC, this was really, really exciting that for the first time we were presenting social value as part of the proposition for sustainable bu buildings with the same emphasis as the financial business case. For those of you who are unfamiliar with this phrase, uh, I'm using the UK Green Building Council's definition here that social value is created when buildings, places and infrastructure support environmental, economic and social well-being, and in doing so improve the quality of life of people. So it's all about creating better places for people, whether that be when buildings are operational, whether that be for the local community or during construction or even in the material supply chain. Now, we included this in the report as we believe and recognize that social value is increasing in prominence around the world. And I'd be interested to perhaps see some comments from you all about whether you would agree with this, but particularly in geographies like the US, Canada, Europe, the UK, there is an increasing amount of research and awareness on this topic. Now, drivers that have triggered this that we analysed included the impact of COVID-19, of course. Uh, I'm sure we're all very cognizant of the impact that's had on our general awareness of health and well-being overall. Secondly, increasing awareness of social value from the private sector, the rise of CSR, corporate sustainability reporting, 
we know that uh, over 90% of companies uh, tend to publish CSR reports. And then slightly more politically minded, but public drivers that include both policy and procurement uh, are drivers of the rise in social value. And it's becoming an opportunity for organizations to set themselves apart in the tender process, particularly for procurement, to be looking at how they can include and even quantify social value benefits in obtaining the contracts for public development projects. So I'm showing you here some recent trends from the World Green Building Trends 2021 survey, uh, otherwise known as the Dodge Data Survey. You maybe would have seen it at the end of last year, where we're pulling out here the social drivers of green buildings. And for me, or, or for us, I suppose, this is particularly interesting because it shows that the social factors overall are the most powerful drivers in the global south, especially in Africa. And so we have to recognize that this social value proposition is going to maybe be an even more tangible way of engaging the mass market towards green and sustainable buildings and infrastructure assets. It's got to be part of our strategy for wider market engagement in the built environment. And I think that's extremely relevant as we're all starting to think about COP27 in Egypt later this year, COP28 in the Emirates next year. And so what are the ways in which social value can be created and enhanced? You're potentially wondering if you're thinking about some of your own projects. We encourage consideration of social value at three scales, ranging from the individual asset, being able to think about the occupants, their, their indoor environmental quality and how that impacts their health and well-being. Everything from their physical and mental comfort through to the behaviour choices that the building or space encourages them to undertake. Secondly, community benefit, including jobs, resilience, equity, and this consideration of social value, not just within the footprint of your own building, but wider looking at your local community and across the supply chain as well, looking at point three there to include worker welfare, human rights and justice is a topic that I feel very passionately about that World GBC is really increasingly advocating for and we have done for a couple of years since the publication of our health and well-being framework but I think there's going to be a huge increase in awareness in social value across the supply chain not just in the building and construction sector but across all sectors as social value is starting to become more prominent in all of these sectors but for buildings and construction specifically we know the supply chain is an area where there are huge problems still in terms of gender equality in the workforce, in terms of issues, including human rights violations and even modern slavery in the materials supply chain. So it's obviously fantastic that these um, topics are increasing in prominence and we want to support that as far as possible. So one of the things that's tricky with social value is how to quantify it, is how to measure it and benchmark it. And this is something that there's not an easy answer to yet. There are lots of different methodologies around measuring social value, and it's an area that's really rapidly evolving in practice, and it's going to be continually important as ESG reporting becomes far more normalized and enforced by policy. But the recognition that we have made and the, the, the encouragement that we are writing through this report and through wider communications is that we suggest that as social value is increasingly becoming easier to quantify that this will initiate and catalyze market momentum to favorably value built assets that advance social value across the supply chain and negatively I think as social value or supply chain audits or all of these other models become increasingly normalized if you have an asset or a product or a service that is not enhancing or is even harming social value in some way that's increasingly going to be an asset that would be a risk to be holding in some way shape or form so this is a, a market prediction in a way but there's so much data to back it up that it seems a really robust way of suggesting to investors that social value's got to be part of the business case for sustainable buildings if they want a resilient and future-proofed investment So the final section I want to share with you this evening are our outputs around the future scenario modelling. And 
there's a huge amount of depth in here, which I won't go into in too much detail, but at a high level, we use modeling based on IPCC aligned 2050 future scenarios. These were undertaken through a series of dedicated sessions with our task force run by WSP, who were acting as consultants through the last year. And for this specific modeling section around climate, we considered scenarios including both one and a half and three degrees of warming and explored the different value proposition for sustainable buildings in these two future scenarios. One being a best case scenario and one being a worst or unfortunately potentially likely future scenario. But whether you want to be optimistic or pessimistic, the outcomes were really strong in both categories in favour of sustainable built assets, signalling that the value proposition remains strong and will only continue to strengthen. And a lot of that is around resilience, highlighting that even in a one and a half degree scenario, there still will, will be increasing amounts of climate change impacts, extreme weather, rising sea levels, so many other issues and sustainable assets with inbuilt resilience, with lower costs and the ability to be dismantled, to be repaired, to be adapted, moved as needed, will offer a more flexible and long term investment. So we also repeated this exercise around health and well-being, looking at the scenarios and the continued development of the trend on global wellness, the impact that's having, the growth it's having around ESG, around corporate sustainability reporting and organizations' reputational risk in light of COVID-19, and the fact that uh, obviously people want to ensure that people's offices, hospitals, schools, homes are protecting and enhancing their health. And again, we found that global health and well-being focus in either scenario will mean that ESG performance and reputation, risk mitigation, all these factors will continue to grow in importance for all asset classes. And interestingly, we thought that was, would be extended to infrastructure as well due to political pressure. Okay, now I mentioned this case study very briefly earlier on, but it's time to show you now. Uh, if you choose to dive into the report, it illustrates all of the above points with a really diverse range of case studies from across the world. And I'm showcasing this one here from the Great Lakes region, the Sangoban office in Pennsylvania. And I find this a really interesting case study because Sangoban undertook a lot of measurements which systematically quantified employees' perceptions of productivity, of health, of comfort, when they moved into this new headquarters in comparison to their previous headquarters. So they've got really interesting before and after data sets. And these results, as we talked about earlier, obviously go straight to a company's bottom line because these employees being healthier, happier, more engaged, more productive will lead to a more profitable organization. And some statistics that came out of this case study include the fact that occupant satisfaction improved by close to 50% in the new space. And in the first three weeks of occupancy, the productivity of the call center within this building increased by 140%, but there were no changes in hours or staff. So people were just literally doing more work because of the environment it suggested. Employees also found the new building to be supportive of their health and well-being and reported a 54% increase in perceived health based on improved environmental quality. So I find that interesting that both occupants reported that they felt healthier and it was being shown in productivity metrics and turnover as well. And there's loads more data on this and lots more interesting stats like that. So I'd encourage you to have a look at the report to read about this specific case study and so many others from around the world uh, with different typologies and use classes featured as well. So to conclude on our Beyond the Business Case report, at World GBC, we're calling for deep unprecedented collaboration and multi-stakeholder action across the value chain. And with this report and the really robust and varied set of arguments it presents, we can now confidently say that you cannot afford not to invest in sustainability. That it's not just the ethical thing to do, it's also a sound business strategy from a financial risk mitigation and future-proofing uh, perspective. 
So you can see the link on screen there. I hope you'll enjoy reviewing it. There's also an executive summary version on our website as well, in case you would rather have a look at a briefer version. And then there is the full report available for you to dive into at your leisure. But I will finish up now with this presentation section and hand back to Laura, but thank you very much for your time today, everybody. And I'll be very happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Katrina. Fantastic presentation and <clears throat> really such an important report to get out to support industry and decision makers and transforming to a sustainable built environment. Um, <clears throat> we have several questions to get through, so I'm going to go ahead and just dive, dive right into them. And I encourage the audience to keep any questions coming um, in the Q&A box, and we'll get through as many of them as, as we can. Um, so this first question, Katrina, is regarding social value. Um, and what's unique about this report um, is its consideration and focus on the social journey and social value proposition, uh, bringing attention to the interconnectedness of environment and people. How do you identify and deliver on that meeting point of decarbonization and social impact? Thanks, Laura. That's a great question. And I think one of the other one of the reasons it's so important for us to talk a lot about social value is that the meeting point between decarbonization and social value isn't distinct they are in many ways the same conversation that if we're going to decarbonize in a sustainable way we also need to have the conversation about just transition about if we're transitioning our energy systems how do we do so in a way that we aren't creating risk to certain sectors of the population, people who work in industries that will be stepped away from as we move away from um, the historic to new types of fuels. So even within the most energy focused parts of the decarbonization conversation, there's still a really strong social value consideration that people are increasingly thinking about. And then on the other side of the scale, social value and community health and well-being is going to be so impacted by climate change as we're experiencing the impacts of increasing extreme weather and we need to consider adaptation and resilience on a broader scale that social value is increasingly becoming interconnected with resilience in the built environment as well so i think the that it's been a really great journey for us to go down this path of recognizing the fact that that social value is being considered a, a new term using inverted commas and sustainability in many ways, but actually it's totally intrinsic to so many areas that we've talked about for decades. Yeah, exactly. And the um, sort of follow-up up question also on the social value is um, that, you know, it's interesting to see the social value of health and well-being considered as a top benefit um, and this is without a standard formula for financially quantifying the social value of a green building. And I know from um, the report, um, when I was reading it specific to uh, Canada and the US, it was um, it illustrated that the most important benefits recognized were lower operating costs, but also improved occupant health and well-being. So it's nice to nice to see that being recognized as one of the top benefits. Um, so I guess the follow-up question is, um, you know, based on your experience, was this benefit, uh, the social value and the, you know, improved occupant health and well-being, was this uh, benefit already being recognized and valued, or has the importance of occupant health and well-being and other social value parameters been pushed to the forefront as a result of the pandemic? Mm, great question. Um, I mean, I, I think that that's one of these things that everybody will have an opinion on it. We as an organization have reported and noted that a lot more of our members uh, are the Green Building Councils, as well as our corporate partners and the Green Building Councils members themselves have been more actively engaged in health and well-being since the pandemic beginning, particularly with topics like indoor air quality and things like that that were so relevant to disease transmission so I think 
the data and the, the market trends that we've experienced say yes. And from a personal level, I think definitely yes as well. But it will be really interesting, I think, to see how that continues developing as hopefully we move into a world in the next few years where we're able to live with COVID. Will that trend of wellness continue uh, remaining high on everybody's agenda or will people start looking for the next thing? And that was one of the things we explored in the future scenario modeling. And I think there's feeling amongst the, the expert predictors in this world that the, the wellness trend is here to stay. Yeah, good, I, I, I hope so. <laughs> Um, okay, so another um, question. Let's see. This is uh, what are regulatory or incentives tools to overcome split agency? In Ottawa, our nonprofits uh, who build, own, operate rental buildings and supply affordable housing are building green. Our developers, builders, complete, compete on price and say there is no market for green buildings. That's a great question. And that's um, a very timely and interesting uh, point of context to be shared as we're exploring a piece of work currently around affordable housing and how we can encourage affordable housing to be more sustainable. And there have been many examples of that, that when social infrastructure is directed by, by governments or nonprofits or public agencies, the standards of sustainability are so much higher. I think um, in the case that has been presented in that question, um, it's, a, it's a part of us needing to try and trigger market demand and trying to demonstrate the fact that, first of all, there are these sustainable buildings available and hopefully try to demonstrate ways in which they are better. Perhaps they retain their value. Perhaps people feel healthier inside all the different benefits I talked about. But if there's a supply and demand issue there, I guess the, the issue is going to be or perhaps the resolution is going to be trying to trigger that demand and making the mass market realize the opportunity of being able to generate energy in their own home or lower energy bills or better warmth in the Canadian winter, whatever it might be. Right, and I guess the report does, uh, does mention on the increased uh, market demand. Um, and it's important to get that report into the, uh, the regulator's hands to help mm. with those decisions. Um, yeah, absolutely. An another question is, um, how might we better integrate public and private capital allocations across different sectors in the built environment, especially breaking through the silos around buildings, energy, and transport? Mm -hmm. For example, one of the highest impact, albeit underrated, decisions a company can make is to site offices and locations well served by public and active transport instead of locations only accessible by private car. Okay, I think there's loads and loads of stuff in there. And I'll speak to the first bit first of how we can encourage this private public collaboration in terms of the financing and development of pieces. And this is a topic that we've been thinking about a lot at the moment. And part of that is because of the housing piece of work that I mentioned. We're also starting to think internally about our responsibility to consider infrastructure alongside buildings, how we can support the infrastructure that helps take buildings on their individual decarbonisation journey. That's um, all published in that Beyond Buildings report that Laura mentioned in the introduction. But one of the barriers and sticking points that we've heard again and again is that we often find that public agencies and private capital markets are talking about different things when they're talking about sustainable buildings and perhaps the, the, the public organization is being dictated by a set of principles which are have been utilized across the organization, across the government. They're not necessarily cutting edge. They're, they may not be as strong as what the advocacy organizations working in that market would be calling for in terms of sustainability principles. And in comparison, the private sector has so much more flexibility and that goes two ways. That goes either the way in which the private sector has phenomenal leadership and are so far ahead of what's coming out of public procurement contract tenders or the other way around in the like in the previous example where there's no regulatory enforcement to do it and actually the the public infrastructure is stronger in terms of sustainability so one of the outputs that world gbc believes that we can use to support this transition to having a united approach to sustainability 
is by trying to come up with really clear and easy sets of principles that can be used by both private and public bodies. And within our health and well-being topic, we have that health and well-being framework that has six principles that underpin it. We, under net zero, we have principles for net zero, considering operational and embodied carbon as well. And our hope with that is that if you have organizations working in collaboration, even if they are totally different stakeholders, they can at least agree in activating the same set of sustainability principles as a shared goal and a shared vision, which I think is the first step to be able to have a united level of ambition across all areas of the built environment, whether they're funded by public or private capital. I've then forgotten the second part of that question. Sorry, Laura. <laughs> Uh, I might have spoken to it already. I think I think so. Let's see. Um, yeah, I, I think you I think you captured that um, breaking through the silos around buildings, energy, and transport, and then gave an example. So um, we have another uh, another uh, question, or I guess it's a, a comment. I think, or maybe a, a request for example. But it says many of the cases were new construction. Any insights on this for existing structures or abandoned structures? Yeah, sure. Um, a couple of the projects in there are retrofitted buildings. Um, the case study is in, that's in Madrid is a 1920s building and it's an incredible example of circular economy. Um, so there are, they're not, they aren't all new buildings, but in terms of the, the call for case studies that we um, went, that we distributed around the world. We published the ones that had the, the best um, sustainability credentials and were able to show what can be done in the market. And it's a, it's a challenge that we have to deal with, isn't it? That it's easier to implement really radical, innovative sustainability design practices into new buildings, rather than if you are keeping an existing structure and you have to keep the heavy materials. But that a lot of that, I think, will change as we increasingly report emissions to include whole life cycle emissions if you are considering the embodied carbon of a building then actually your retrofitted building will be the will be the highlight of um sustainable practice and um, there just i don't think are quite as many incredible examples of really sustainable retrofits yet but in terms of the strategies of energy generation adaptation and resilience health and social value and every, and circularity and everything else there's absolutely no reason that they can't be included in existing buildings as well as new within the parameters obviously that you're already dealing with it's just that um we we didn't have as many good examples yeah and um in addition to the examples in the reports um correct me if i'm wrong but doesn't world green building council have case studies on its website as well yeah thank you uh, yeah we have a case study library that um people can go and have a look at there's great examples of um net zero of healthy buildings of buildings of different rating tools and certifications from all over the world that should um have lots more examples yeah and, and certainly serve to inspire um okay so continuing um on with the questions so we have another one is world gbc working on a global standard and methodology for embodied carbon who are you working with we are just learning how huge this is. It is so huge. It's so all encompassing and terrifying. We are not developing a standard, but we have a huge volume of guidance of technical materials and thought leadership on embodied carbon. And we encourage organizations to report on their whole life cycle emissions through the World Green Building Council commitment, which has just progressed from looking only at operational emissions to whole life cycle, including embodied. So, um, I appreciate it's a totally massive and, and overwhelming topic, but if you have a look at the World GBC website in the advancing net zero section, there's quite a lot in there, uh, which is not too technical. Hopefully we'll break it down um, into more digestible chunks in terms of how to understand the, the responsibilities we have to tackle embodied carbon within our buildings and construction and ways in which we can do it. Yeah, it's such a big task. Um, regarding the circular economy, um, at what stage 
of design or construction do you see as the best window of opportunity to prevent unnecessary waste going to landfill? So to keep that uh, you know, embodied carbon low, is that the job of industry or regulators? Oh, what a great question. I think this is what makes circularity harder than decarbonization. And that's a controversial thing to say. Um, but if I wanted to totally decarbonize the house I'm sitting in in central London right now, I could do quite a lot myself. Obviously requires capital. I would need to be able to finance the solar panels I'd want to put on my roof, the ground source heat pump I want to put outside. But there's quite a lot of action you can take as an individual in terms of retrofitting a property and making it energy efficient and in terms of generating energy on site. But in terms of the circular economy, obviously there are small scale things that you can do in terms of managing your, your food waste and your lifestyle and your, the business models you support that reduce ownership models. But on a building and construction scale, you can't build a house or a bridge with recycled or reused materials that are locally sourced if there are no recycled or reusable materials nearby. And you end up potentially having a great embodied carbon life cycle assessment calculation challenge if you're considering the transport of bringing reused materials in from halfway around the world versus using virgin materials nearby. And that's why it's so incredibly difficult to quantify, because for a circular economy, we do need the whole system to, to transform. We need the demand for for circular materials. We need the infrastructure so that materials can be treated in a way in which when they are dismantled or reused at the end of their life, they can be returned into a technological or biological cycle so that they can be turned into other products and not contaminated by crossing these two different materials that need to be kept separately. So I think in answer to what stage it can be best implemented, I think there is no... I guess that that's the that's the flip side of this question, isn't it? That because it requires such systemic change, everybody can take responsibility for it a little bit, particularly with new projects, but very much um, still something we can think about with um, with retrofitting as well. But there are some great examples within the report, and one is um, I think it's the University of Wollongong in Australia, where they profiled the fact that all of the heavy materials in the building came from the deconstruction of a local bridge and things like that. So it requires innovation. It requires movement away from standard business models and practice and design. But if you have a design team where you've got developers and investors prepared to take the risk in moving away from business as usual and commit to these sustainable practices, designers and engineers who are willing to do that and prepared to use recycled concrete even if it looks slightly different to the concrete they wanted to use before and you have owners and occupiers who might be willing to pay a site a slight surplus for a building that they've had to use these in innovations and materials that are not yet widely available on the mass market at a low cost and that's the huge level of collaboration that we need to achieve these case studies and hopefully as the circular economy increasingly normalizes and becomes popular, we will see more examples of that. And then it will be easier for me retrofitting my home to be able to say, when I dismantle all of these materials, I'm going to go and put them in the heavy materials store that's down the road and let someone else use them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It's such an opportunity for creativity and innovation, but does require that, uh, you know, multi-stakeholder collaborative approach. Totally. Um, I, I think we have time for one last question. Um, so this one is again, going back to social value proposition. Um, it is the social value proposition would be more compelling on a district or city level. Would World GBC look into a case study from this perspective or guidance for a city level? Definitely, definitely. Um, we do not yet have guidance on city level, but it's something that we are actively thinking about. Uh, a lot of our guidance traditionally has been around individual asset level, but as our strategy is starting to get a bit broader, that's something we're really conscious that we need to address. So thank you for that comment. It keeps it fresh in my mind. Uh, I think a lot of the principles though are equally relevant and adaptable. Um, whether you were talking about social value at an individual 
building scale or on a on a community scale if you are designing a property or, do, or you're designing a master plan the principles of incorporating nature supporting e ecosystem services of creating healthy livable places of creating comfortable places that enhance mental health the the practical implementation of them looks slightly different at scale but I think the principles are really very much the same but I hope that we'll be able to provide more tangible guidance on that soon great so we'll <clears throat> we'll just have to all stay tuned I'll be back when we've got it <laughs> <laughs> great well I think that's all the time we have for questions um, thank you Katrina for sharing your insight and diving into the beyond the business case report with us today um, it really is so important that conversations like this um, are happening to build you know, common ground that will help form solutions and collaboration at the regional level, but also beyond. So thank you again, Katrina, and thank you to our audience for your attention and also engaging with your questions. They've been, they've been great and um, really interesting discussion. Um, the Council of the Great Lakes Region is working to bring additional content and webinars as part of our virtual series, so please stay tuned as we'll be announcing some new virtual events um, very shortly. Also, if you would like to get involved in the Council of the Great Lakes Region or our programs, share, <coughs> share thoughts or ideas, <coughs> excuse me, um, please reach out to me or anyone from our team. <coughs> We'd love to hear from you. Um, and lastly, um, we know many of you are eager to start having these meaningful dialogues and conversations in person again. We are, um, and we're very happy to announce that the Great Lakes Economic Forum will be held uh, in person this year after a two year hiatus due to the pandemic. The in-person Great Lakes Economic Forum will be held uh, June 26 to 28th in Chicago. Um, we hope to see you there. Registration is open. And there is a link to the to the website and the registration on the screen, and I believe it's also uh, in the chat box. Um, so that concludes today's webinar. Um, thank you all again, and hope to see you at the Great Lakes Economic Forum in Chicago this June. Thank you.